Okay, so today we're going to take a look at the Oracle Academy slides for Java Fundamentals 3.9. Um, the unit will cover abstraction. Um, we've actually been doing this a little bit. We'll get a little deeper and try to understand some of the things that we've been doing. Our objectives will be to define abstraction and provide an example of when it is used, and we will also define casting. With abstraction, you can program a new instance to perform a single specific task, such as play a sound when a specific keyboard key is pressed, or display a set of questions and answers every time a game is started. To create programs on a larger scale, for example, one that creates 10 objects that each performs different actions, you need to write programming statements that let you repeatedly create objects that perform different tasks. By just providing the specifics and for the differences. And we've seen some of this with using random um, when we create multiple actors, the actor subclasses to appear from the constructor of the world, um, things like this when we separate tasks into separate procedures and then call the procedure from the act method. Those are some of the things they're referring to here. So the first example they give is creating um, 10 objects programmatically and placed in different locations up to network. And they tell us that it's inefficient to write 10 lines of code for each object, which is what we've been doing up till now. Um, instead, abstract the code and write more generic statements to handle the creation and positioning of the objects. And we'll get to see that in just a moment. The principle of, of abstraction um, is that we want to reduce duplication of information in a program by making use of abstractions. And we're going to see that we did a little bit in Alice with loops. Um, I think it was a number of times block that we could use or a while block. Um, and this way we don't have to just keep typing the same thing over and over. The abstraction principle can be a general thought, such as don't repeat yourself. Um, in a lot of cases, even reusing code would be abstracting the code, things that we want to be able to use in another project. We make it very generic, and then we can work specifically through parameters. Here they give another example. Uh, you want to create a board game that has blocks, trees, sticks, and widgets. You do not need to write repetitive programming statements to add each of these items. Instead, you can abstract the procedure to simply add objects to a game board in a specific location. Here's a pseudocode example of how we were doing things previously, or somewhat, I guess. Um, for example, when you add a fly to the world, it will also have a maximum speed that can move and an initial direction that it is heading. Your code will add a fly to specify the maximum speed it can move and the starting direction. So here's some pseudocode. I don't know if we've spoke much about pseudocode, but it's more or less English language um, to quickly show what you're going to do in programming. It, it has a combination of that programming format with English language. Now here they're adding extra parameters that we haven't seen before, but we see three lines create new fly. We really want to get this down to a single create new fly statement, um, and then we can use repetition, because here here we have three, it's easy enough to type three, but what if we wanted 20 flies or 30 flies? As they mentioned now, imagine the code needed for 300 fly images. To implement abstraction, we create a method that creates a new object that is positioned where needed and displays the appropriate image. What we want to do is call the method with a new object, image, and position. And then we need a statement that will allow this to happen 
300 times or any number of times. So as for abstraction techniques, um, abstraction occurs in many ways in programming. One technique is to abstract programming code using variables and parameters to pass different types of information to a statement. Um, and we've seen this with move, which takes one parameter, and we've seen this with set location, which takes two, an X and a Y value. Another technique is to identify similar programming statements in different parts of a program that could be implemented in just one place by abstracting out the various parts. We've seen this where we created a bug class and then spider and fly were able to inherit from that bug class. Examples that they give us here would be if we're creating a game and we want to catch other objects, um, we can increase the score by different value depending on what object was caught. Right now we just have our game set up so that if a fly gets caught, then we increase the score by 1. We could use abstraction by having an event increase the score by using a parameter rather than a set value. So different objects may pass different values to score or increase score, and we could have it increase by 1, 2, 5, 10, whatever we choose. We can even have penalties that decrease the score. So we'll take a look at constructors using variables. Um, in this example, fly has a variable to find this to store the current speed. Um, again, we're currently, everything is at speed 1, I believe. Um, but we could set a variable as a parameter um, or set by a parameter. And that will go ahead and um, make it so that flies may have varying speeds. Um, we're also going to set it up so that the initial rotation of the fly is set. So let's go ahead and look at the fly code. And we will code in the constructor. First, we'll declare the variable for private int speed. Then we're going to go ahead and we'll code the constructor public fly int max speed int direction. And then we'll set speed equal to green foot get random number max speed plus one. See if you could figure out why that is while we type the rest. Set rotation direction. And I inadvertently put an equal sign down at the bottom. Didn't realize that. So now we've cleared up any errors. We still will have some errors, though, if we go ahead and take a look. Um, B world was calling the new fly or calling a fly and remember now we need two parameters switch pages here right we are requiring two parameters a speed and a direction so for all of these out of convenience let's set speed to and direction to 90 Should get rid of those errors. Uh, we still have inside B where I called the fly, and we'll put a parameter of 2, comma 90 over here. That hopefully resolved all of my issues. It did. Um, so now my flies, when I reset. They're all facing 90. I assume that's 90. Let's change one just to see what happens. 
the collateral rate will be 191 180 and let's see if that makes a difference notice it did um, that's probably my 0 90 180 and 360 would be up so let's take a quick look just in case you don't understand what we did with this. The constructor runs when we create the object. And what's happening is we set two parameters, one max speed, which I put in two, um, and one for the direction, um, which I varied. When the object is created, max speed will then get passed over here, max int max speed to max speed. And our speed will be where I put 2, the maximum is 2. Remember that the random number is 1 less than the max, so it would be 0 or 1. We add a 1, which gives us a 1 or 2. Um, if you're still a little confused, ask me, ask your neighbor. Um, the next thing that got passed was the direction, and so when we create the fly, we'll set the, set the rotation to that direction. Hopefully those make sense. We'll move along here. Um, I already set that move speed um, within our fly. Um, actually, I did it, so let's get that in there. Move speed so that they can all move that random amount, which will only be a one or a two at this point. Um, we needed to place the parameters within our calls, um, and we've already taken a look at that. Um, we can move along from there. Uh, they use the other format here, and they set various directions, and they also set various um, locations. I left the locations that I previously had, um, but we're going to modify this anyway. We're going to do this programmatically. So abstract code to a method. Uh, they tell us you can anticipate abstraction during the design phase of a project, or you can examine programming code to identify statements that would benefit from abstraction. I like this one because, as you just saw, we had to go back and change all the parameters that we had when we called flies. If we take this into account during planning, we don't have to go back and modify every time we realize there's a better way to do something. Um, but oftentimes, you recognize an opportunity to abstract programming statements when writing lines of code that appear repetitive, like we are now. And so you may say, uh, well, I need to add five flies, ten flies, when initially we only wanted one or two, so at that time we go back and modify the code. So here they show us an example. We don't need to actually do this, but notice how repetitive this is. Um, two, four, six, eight, ten flies. Um, and it looks like somebody just tried to randomly place these throughout the board. So there may be and there is a better way to do that. The way to do that is they show us using a for loop. And so we're going to go ahead and um, set up a for loop to create the flies. Um, those will go in B-World. I'm going to remove the flies I already have. I could still leave this in prepare, um, or you can have it in the main area, but really prepare is better. We're abstracting the code. this back where we can see everything and let's go ahead and shrink that a little and we'll put this to the side This part is already up here, and then we're calling prepare. So this that's why I'm going to put the, only the for loop in prepare. 
So for loop starts with for int. I'll explain what everything is once we're done. At this point, we're just going to copy it in. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get a random number for the direction. Remember that the 360 will only go from 0 to 359, which is fine. That gets us the complete circle. Notice the variables that we're creating are self-commenting, which means that looking at the variable, we can generally tell what that variable is actually for. So the x coord variable will be our x coordinate. Our y coord variable will be the y, the y coordinate. Um, and then when we create our new flies, Add the first parameter, new fly, and in there we're going to use current max speed, which I forgot to declare at the beginning, so we'll do that. Um, but current max speed and direction, those are the two parameters for the constructor we just now set up, and then we're going to set the X chord and the Y chord. Um, we'll declare the variable before the constructor um, int current max speed equals two. We should have no errors. And if we come and take a look at the world, notice I get my 10 flies. Um, we'll look at, make sure that I was clear with this. Um, the for loop starts with 4, and inside the parentheses, we initialize a variable at 0. It's typical just to use i as incrementer. Um, you may see c for counter or something like that. Um, as long as i is less than 10, we're going to run this, and each time it runs, we'll increase i by 1. So initially, i is 0, and we set up, we get a new random number, um, two of those, actually three, one for the direction, one for the coordinates, each of the coordinates. Um, and then we create a new object using those random numbers, um, and then one non-random number that we set at the top. Um, once it's done, it's going to come back. Once it goes through, it's going, or even before it goes through, this zero becomes a one, um, and it goes through. Now it's a one. One is less than ten. It will add a one to make it two and go through. Now it's two. Two is less than ten. It will add a one, make it three, and go through. And it cycles until we're at ten. And then 10 is not less than 10, so we'll go ahead and we'll exit, and then we'll do whatever else is left in the code. And they show us the simple abstraction. Um, at this point, they're creating a baby, um, which we really don't need a baby. Um, but what if you had a little had a little knowledge of Greenford or programming and wanted to create a game to move a baby around the screen? You could simplify how to move an actor object around the screen by creating a simple set of movement methods. Move right, move left, move up, move down. Um, provides a simpler abstraction than the standard Greenford API with its built-in set location, get x, get y method. Um, we kind of see this, even though I think if you, they're, what they're saying is if you have little knowledge, 
not really programming it, but using it. Kind of like now, we use a built-in move method rather than having to code a move method from scratch. So they're creating a baby subclass. And what I'm thinking is that we can do this um, just for the example. Maybe we'll do this in a um, in our bug subclass. Since that's where we code some of these things we would like to be able to use. Let me get this where we can do it. And um, it looks like all they're doing, at least to start, is setting up a speed. Private, static, final, and speed. That final means this is a constant. We've learned variable, variables change. Constants do not change. Um, so private, static, final, and speed constant. If later on we try to change this using code, we will get an error. We can only change it in this spot. An advantage of using this is it still looks like a variable in within the program. So if we use it 10 times and later we decide we don't like 4 but want 3, we change it in one place. The next thing that we're going to do is add our move methods. Get that line there. So we're going to start with public void move right. We want to be consistent with the braces. It doesn't matter which way you use. Notice how it wasn't consistent here. Actually, that was what they started with. We'll go ahead and set location. Get X plus speed. Make sure that's capitalized. This is case sensitive. Get Y. And since I am a little bit lazy and don't want to have to type all of this or have you watch me type all of this, we will go ahead and paste. Try to keep things lined up. It works just as well if you don't, but it's easier to catch mistakes if you do. So we'll go move right, move left. Left is going to subtract the speed, bring us in the opposite direction. Then we'll have move up. That's going to be get x. And then the y is going to be subtracted by speed. Um, and then we will add speed when we move right. Oops, I need to change that to move down. So at this point, um, we should have a method that we can call um, move right, move left, move up, move down. And they have us coding the act method of something to do that. Now, we don't have a baby. Um, so what I'm going to do is let's add an ant. I don't need to do that. New subclass. New subclass will be ant. And let's code up. Code the ant. I need to add the ant. So in the ant act method, let's get this added here. Um, if down, and we, we are already using these keys for the B. So what I'm going to do is, um, if the U is down, I need to pay attention to me, not the um, instructions now. Let's 
uh, put a brace here. If the U is down, we're going to move up. And then what I'll do is like I did before, if the N is down, we'll move down. If the H is down, we'll move left. And if the J is down, we'll move right. Because I have no errors, so hopefully everything works well. Let's add an ant. And the only thing I'm going to worry about is moving that ant. So U is up, N is down, H, J. Everything else should still work. So let's head back to the other. Twice. Accessing methods in other classes. Sometimes we want to access methods and properties in other classes. During a collision, we can gain a reference to the collided object by using a method like get one intersecting object. We also have the option of calling the world method that would return all objects and then locating the one we want. Um, and we've done this with world get with. Um, world add object, I believe we've done that, get world add object. But what happens if we want to access another act or a method outside of a collision, or we don't want to iterate through all of the objects? So we'll go ahead and they tell us we're going to extend the B world class. Um, so we could keep the score, we could have kept the score in the B world class, which we've actually been doing right now through B. And then we create methods to read and update the score. It allows easy updating of the score from any actor. Um, so let's go ahead and code this into the B World class. We go into the B World class, and inside um, the main class, we're going to add. Private and score equals zero and create a method public and get score because we have an int it means it returns something it's going to return so what happens is as the score changes, this number will change. Um, we can use get score to return that. Um, we also may want to update the score. Public void update score. And right now, the only way we can update the score, the only amount we can update the score, is by one. But if you understand the way this is worked, we could put an int and then s or something here, and then um, the score could increase by that parameter. We'd need a little bit different code. You don't need to worry about that if you don't understand it, but there's an idea if you do. So now we have the B world configured for score updates, um, accessing other objects methods. So now they tell us in the B world, in the B class, we can try to update the score using um, myworld.updateScore or worldmyworld.equalsGetWorld um, and then update the score. We're not going to do it. We're going to find that it would create an error because the um, return type is world and world does not contain the method for update score, right? We're using B world, not world. So 
that higher level doesn't know about update sport. We created the update sport here in B World. Um, so although a B World is a type of world, Java will check the methods of world, and if the method is not there, an error is produced. So we need to do something called casting. Casting basically tells um, an object to use the information of a more specific object um, or class, more specific type of class, which is what they say here. Um, Jot casting is when we want to tell the Java compiler that a class we are accessing is really another more specific type of class. In our previous example, we want to tell the compiler that the world class is really a B-world class. So we have to cast it. And this is what we need to use right here. Um, B world my world equals B world and then get the world and then my world dot update score. The reason, another reason we do this is remember each world is a separate instance and even though we only have one world, um, each instance has a different name. We can see this in the fly. Notice this is fly 7. This is fly 8. Because we don't know what that name is going to be, what we're telling the code is um, to go ahead and get the current world, and then whatever world it is, let's give that to my world. So we're telling the current world So we're telling the current world, um, we don't know what you are, so let's go ahead and get that name. And we'll, whatever it is, we're going to put it into a variable by name my world. Now we know that variable's name, so we can refer to it specifically and say my world update the score. So we're going to go ahead and... Um, Code that in right now, and we'll go into. So we'll code that into the um, B. And so here we are. Let's get the B code up there. We're no longer going to need the int score in the B. We won't have to set a score to zero in the B. And then our update score, we won't need, but well, let's co add our code here so we can still call update score from our hack method, which doesn't look like I have it in there. I think it may get called from somewhere else. I think it's called from the catch fly update score. Um, so we'll go ahead and let's add this code in here. Um, e world, my world. That my world could be any name you like. Um, that's how we're going to refer to this later. B world is the type we want this to be rather than world, and then get world, which is going to get the current world we're in. Then we could say my world dot update score. What I'm going to do now is take this code from here. I don't need it there anymore. We'll put it in B world on update score. Now we no longer have to get the world anymore because it's in the world. We're not referring to it. Show text score. It's going to give me the score. It's going to append or um, concatenate, is what this is called, the score from this variable at that location. No errors, so hopefully everything works well.
to notice it looks the same but because we changed the location later if we want other objects to update the score we can easily do that so now let's go back to our slides we're just about done accessing other actors we can do in the same manner um, when we create the B um, this is going to return the bee's name, um, but it shows us create a private field. That private field can't be accessed directly, but it can be accessed um, through get B, and that will go ahead and get the bee's name. Um, and they're showing how we can use that within our um, program. Let's make the, this is going to go in B world, so let's go in B world. Okay, so what we're going to do here is declare a variable private E B equals new B. That declared our variable, it's going to be called B and it's going to create um, the B. And then, I've actually already changed this, um, add object B is going to work off of our next, um, we're going to say public B get B and that will Turn the B. Now we're getting an error here. Cannot find symbol method. This is no longer a method. We can take that out. Um, and I also took out the new. Um, so here we go. We have our. We have a way to identify the specific B, and that's going to be using um, get B. So the next thing we do is we're going to make it so our spider might turn towards the B and try to catch it. Um, and we'll code that in. I don't have access to spider through there yet, so let's code in that, code that into spider. Um, we could leave it in his path. I probably should separate this out. Um, so actually, we'll put that here. B e world. Do it exactly the same way. We did before. Um, we're casting this. I need to agree with what I put here. Remember, it could have been anything I wanted. This refers to the spider basically saying, I myself should. this out. And my spider caught my fly. That may make my game too difficult. You could possibly put it on another level. 
the terminology we saw was abstraction and casting. Um, in summary, we should be able to now define abstraction and provide an example when it's used, as well as define casting. We won't use casting um, much right now, so don't worry so much about it. You're going to be able to complete our um, Unit 9 projects and also the Unit 10 stuff. Um, it is something that's important in programming, but the amount that we're using it right now, if you get stuck there, um, that's okay. You have some exposure. Everything else you hopefully will understand and be able to use. And that's it for this unit.